Hi guys, Samantha from Jessie Ma Tutorials here and today I'm going to be showing you one of my projects that has been requested for me to do a tutorial on multiple times. So you guys were very excited about this. I hope you've seen the intro video. If you haven't, please have a look at the links below as I'll have a link to the intro video. There you can see exactly what we are going to be making today. So, what we're going to do is we start out with a piece of gold Primo. Now, you don't have to use Primo and you don't have to use gold. Um, I do recommend using a metallic clay for this project as it just brings out a sparkle in the project once you've put the resin on it. But you can use any background clay you want. Just experiment and have fun. So, I've got a multitude of alcohol inks I'm going to be using today. You don't have to use nearly as many. Just choose a few. So I'm going to be using Bottle, Meadow, Botanical, Limeade, Citrus, Lettuce, Latte, Caramel, Ginger, teak wood, and espresso. Now, that was quite a few, and if you haven't guessed, yes, I got a lot of these just a little while ago, and I'm wanting to try them out and see what they look like. But really, if you were going to do this project and you didn't have that many alcohol inks, which I'm expecting you probably don't, just having bottle, botanical, citrus ginger and teak wood is necessary. This was what I did the original project with and as you can see that's basically cut the alcohol inks in half. But I wanted to get a really nice grad gradient and so I've popped in a whole lot of alcohol inks. So we'll start with bottle. Oops. Just open that up. And you're going to need a brush and you're just going to pop your ink on one side and just do just brush it along now because we're doing a gradient we don't want swishing it all over the place I'm just going to be popping it in one area and doing a line of it up the clay so I want to have quite a high concentration of alcohol ink so I'm going to do one or two drops to make sure that I've got the colour nice and even and I find that blowing on it even usually evens out there we go so I'm fairly happy with that now I usually clean it off using a wet wipe you can use um, alcohol 90 99% alcohol works very well for cleaning them off I find that a wet wipe works very well as well and it doesn't stink nearly as badly so, just pack this one away, and I'll go on to the meadow, and I'll just drop a few drops very close to where I put the bottle, and you want this cross-contamination because you're trying to get almost like a Skinner blend, and it's supposed to be uneven as well. And if you don't like it, you can always go back and fix it. This technique is very lenient and it's it's just it's supposed to have fun, so don't don't stress about it. And I'll move on to the botanical now. Some of these are a little old so they've crusted. And I'll just drop those along. Now if you didn't see my intro video to this. I reached 1000 subscribers just the other day and this is my present to all of you for being my subscribers so thank you. Now we move on to Limeade and it's not very obvious the Skinner Blend right now but we're going to um, going to move on. I'll show you how we fix it in a minute. 
So the limeade is very interesting. I haven't seen an ink that looks quite like this before. But I like it. And when you blow, you want to be blowing this way. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I don't really want to bore you to death. I'm going to go ahead and use all of my inks and just grade, pop them onto the clay and get the gradient to pop them all on. And when I've done that, I'll come back and show you how we smooth out the areas like over here. So, I'll see you there. Okay, so I've just finished getting the blend and as you can see it's a pretty good blend but you've got all of these spots all over the place and this one isn't very good so if you're not happy with somewhere you can always go back with your ink and just pop a little bit more on and just use your brush to smooth it out like so just blow on it to get rid of anything now what we do now is we'll just take our brush from one end and we'll just go across and brush and this should get rid of those um, spots now because it's a gradient I'm just going from one end to the other and I'm brushing very lightly and because most of it has dried I'm not actually getting much contamination but the thing is, because it's a blend, I kind of want it to cross over. Like so. And you can just go ahead and do that again if you have to. I'm going to go back the other way. Just to make sure that I got everywhere. There we are. Okay, now what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and clean off our brush. And then I've got this really tiny brush with the really, with the really tiny end. Because now all we want to do is you want to take our 99.8% alcohol. And I'm just going to pour it into a little metal pot over on the side over here. Now, this stuff stinks, so I'm jealous of you guys on the camera because you can't smell it, <laughs> but I can. But you'll just dip your brush in it, and you want to soak it because it's a little brush, but if you're using a big brush like this, you just want to get the end really lightly sprayed because you only want a small drop because it goes a long way. And then you'll just go ahead and dab away where you want it to go, and then you can go back and soak your brush every now and then. Just remember that the first dab is going to come out looking rather large but the more you dab the smaller they get and I want to get this nice watercolor effect because it gets rid of all of those nice those brush lines which I don't really want and it also helps blend the colors together and creates a very nice effect and I'm not cleaning my brush off in between this because I want the colors to cross over each other so you can see that over here I've got some larger dots and you can what you can do is if you think some areas are a little too large for your liking you can always go back in and pop in some more dots to get it crossing over each other some more. So you can play around with this as long as you want. Um, I'm going to play with this for quite a while so you can see what it's going to look like. So I'm just going to cross the clay and I'm going to do this across the entire blend and I'll come back when I've got that all done. So see you there. Okay so I've gone ahead and dappled the entire surface with my brush and the 99% alcohol and so you can see that I've got this really nice watercolour dappled effect. Now what I want to do, so I'm just going to lift this up 
off the tile because we want to let this dry for a little while and in the meantime I'm going to show you what we're going to put on top because this is a little boring on its own so you'll just lift it up like so and now be careful because this alcohol is still wet and so you don't really want to touch it there just bring it up so that hopefully you can see now I'm going to just pop that aside put that to dry and I'm going to bring over my wet wipes that I've been using and I'll just use that to get rid of the alcohol stains well not really stains but the alcohol residue that's built up on my tile because we want our tile clean for the next part now next part is basically a mica shift so I'm gonna go ahead and bring over my oops gold primo clay you can use Kato you can use Fimo really doesn't matter but I'm just gonna take off a piece and now you want to have this really well conditioned but I just want to show you what you what you need so run it through a pasta machine See? Now just carry on running it through, folding it over each other on the thickest setting of my pasta machine because we're going to be putting a stamp through this. And what I'm looking for yeah, I'll show you, is a solid gold colour. If I bring it over here and you can see that there's some dark gold lines and some streaks and stuff, you want a solid gold colour. For more information on that, have a look at my mica shift tutorial as I have a lot more information on doing mica shifts. Now what we'll do is I've got a few stamps over here. I've got Sculpey's Pebble Stamp, though I don't think I'm going to use this one today. I've also got Melanie Muir's Pebble Stamp from her Mountain Collection. And I've also, oops, there we go, got another stamp of hers from her river collection. And I'm going to be using these two today. Now, when you use a pebble stamp, which is what we're going to be using, you want the pebble indents to be facing up and you want the lines between the pebbles facing inward because we want shavings of the lines. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Excuse me. So I've got a little spritz bottle. And I'm going to be using the river stamp first. I'm just going to spray the entire stamp, but we're not going to be using the entire stamp. So I'm going to run this through. So I ran it through on my seventh setting, which was my thicker setting. Now I'm going down to my number five setting. And I'm just going to rip this in half, and we'll use the other half in a minute. Now I'll just lay this over the part of the stamp that I want, and I'm just going to do lay it in, then spray the surface with a bit of water so it doesn't stick to my fingers, and just push it right into the stamp. And I'm just popping it into the pebbly area, because that's the part that I want. Okay. And when you're done, just lift it up. And let's see, got some pebble over there. And now I'll just trim this off. And I'll pop that aside. And now I'll show you what this one looks like. And I'll just spray the surface of that stamp too. And I'll pop my clay in. Spray the surface of the clay to prevent sticking and work that into the stamp. Now, when you're working with stamps, you want to press it into the stamp from one end to the other. So you don't want to be doing it all over the place. That way you can trap air and excess water. You want to be working from one end to the other. So as you can see, I'm working from here up. There we are, basically finished. Just carefully lift that up. There we are, that's what we want. So we don't want our, our clay looking like this one. 
we want our clay looking like this. So this is the reverse of this. And now I'm going to carry on and make a few more pebble um, stamp in some more pebble indents and I'll come back when I have that completely done and I'll show you how to shave it. So I'll see you there. Okay so I've stamped all of these so they're from the exact same stamp I really like these ones and this one's from the other pebble one. So now what I'm going to do is I've got my flexible tissue blade over here and I'm just going to take one of these and I'm going to make sure that it's secure to the tile. You want to pat it down onto the tile so it's nicely stuck. And then you want to take your blade and you want to hold it as close to the middle as possible. And you want to keep your hands resting on your work surface and slowly shave off that raised area like so and that's the bit that you want so just pop that to the side and carry on doing that to the others you want to try and get it so that you have all the open areas like that and that is what we are going to put on our sheet so I'm going to go ahead and do that to the rest of the stamped pieces that I have and I'll come back when I've got a whole bunch of these. So, see you there. Okay, so I've shaved off the pieces that I want and I've brought over the alcohol sheet which by now is fairly dry. Now, just a quick tip. Um, if if you do a lot of mica shifts, it could be worth it for you to save these pieces when you are doing the mica shift and just pop them between two pieces of paper and that way they dry out a bit and that way they're not as fiddly as they are right now and then you can use them in a project like this. But then again, sometimes your slices don't turn out as well as you want to and when you are doing a project like this, it's always good to have some extra. So, if you have, if you do do a lot of mica shift, I recommend saving slices like this. But if you don't do a lot of mica shift, you can always just make your own quickly after you've done the alcohol ink sheet. So once you've done the sheet, you'll just take these. Now you have two sides to choose from. You have the side that was directly stamped into the piece, or you have the side that's nice and flat where you shaved it off with the blade. Now I personally like having this part of the shaving showing because you've almost got you've got a bit of a mica shift on this side you've got dark gold areas and light gold areas whereas this one it's a little bit plain so that's just another thing to think about and you'll just lay it across your alcohol ink sheet and you'll just gently tap you want to be very careful because the ink isn't completely dried because you put a lot of ink on here it's a little bit tacky and so if you accidentally touch it with your finger it will come off on your finger and you don't really want that residue getting onto your nice clean gold shaving. So I'll bring over some of these ones as well. And if you have any, oops, if you're having trouble picking them up you can always just use your blade and slide it under and pop it where you need it to be and just tap it in. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm just going to go ahead and pop all these shavings where I want them to go and I'll come back when I have it the way I want it to be. See you there. Okay, so as you can see I have popped all of the mica slices onto the piece of clay and now what I'm going to do, now this is a very delicate process and takes a little bit of patience. You want to take your roller and very carefully roll over the surface once. Clean it off with your fingers. You can just rub it off to get rid of any residue. Roll across again and make sure with each pass that you clean off your roller. That is paramount. So I'm just busy cleaning it off quickly with a rag. And you can go back again 
and pass over and clean it off again. And the reason you're cleaning it off of it again is because you don't want to get any of the residue from the alcohol onto your mica slices. But you want to flatten out these micas, these pieces on top of the alcohol sheet to make it nice and even. So you'll do that a few times till it's somewhat flat. So I'm fairly happy with that. There's a few areas just over here. If you see an area that's not good, just specifically pass over that area. There, and that's about it. Now we'll take your firm tissue blade and I'm just going to trim up the edges where I had some of these lolling off the edges. Okay, and then you'll just, well, you don't have to pick them off, but I like to pick them off because otherwise they can get the alcohol in them. Then you'll just take your blade and you'll shimmy up your sheet, like so. I'll just bring it up for you to see. That's what it looks like at the moment. So if I, I ripple, if I move it around a bit, you can see that there are some wet areas still. So I'll just move that aside and clean off the tile. Okay, bring this back. Now, you're going to want to go and get some cutters. I've already got some little teardrop ones and that's what I'm going to use today but you can use any cutters you want I like the ones that go from largest to smallest and you're just going to position the largest one in the middle of the stamp somewhere in the middle of the stamp and because I'm going to pop the resin on this I'm not going to dome it or anything I'm just going to cut it clean but you of course could dome this if you wanted to dome this and you didn't want the alcohol going anywhere you could always put a really thin sheet of translucent over it so you could sand it and get it up to a high buff but I'm going to pop a resin on it so I'll just cut that out and then you'll move on to the next one and I'm going to put that as close as possible because when we string the necklace I want to get a colour blend and I want that to be obvious look quite nice when it's finished. Oops. There we are. And we're almost done. Now, what I like to do as well is I kind of like the size. I'm going to make some earrings to go with it. So I just like to cut out some earrings on either side. There. Okay, now also you can see there's a lot of waste up here, which isn't so good, but you can always do something about that because these ones, are, this is what I like about these ones, they kind of fit into each other like that. And so I can usually get two sets out of each, each sheet that I make. Almost done. Okay, I'll just cut an, out an earring there, and I'll cut out an earring over there. There we go. Okay, so I could cut out a few more beads here and there, but I'll do that later on. 
Then you'll just lift it up very carefully again. And try not to handle it too much. If you can avoid handling it, that's best because this alcohol ink will get onto your hands and first of all stain and second of all it will somewhat ruin the pattern sometimes. So I'm just picking that out very carefully. Okay, that's the first lot. <sighs> I'm just going to pop this over to the side so I can use it later. And this is what we have. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going just make sure when you pop them in the oven that you don't have any, dis any distortion because sometimes these guys can have distortion on them. So, just be careful of that when you put them in the oven. Make sure that the shape is correct and I'll come back once these are all baked and I'll show you how to finish them off and pop resin on. See you there. Okay so my pieces are baked over here. I put them in for half an hour at the manufacturer's recommended temperature which is, let me just have a look quickly, the recommended temperature for Primo is 275 Fahrenheit, Fahrenheit and 130 Celsius for 30 minutes. But I like to put these in for about an hour. So, also I've conditioned a piece of black Prima and I've gone ahead and got a 40 grit piece of sandpaper and I've just used it to texture the sheet because this is what the back's going to look like. So what you're going to do is you're going to grab your cutters and you're just going to cut out however many pieces of these you have on the black. So I'll just move these aside. I can do all of them once I've finished showing you how to do one. It doesn't matter if it gets too distorted and also, also we're going to redo the texture so don't worry if you mess it up a little bit. So you'll just take the correct size and try to place it on your piece as accurately as possible and then just manipulate the clay so that it fits in and around the piece. Because remember, clay is flexible and you can stretch it and condense it. So make it work for you and not the other way around. Okay, so that's pretty much on. Now don't worry, it doesn't have to be exact exact because I'm going to show you a little trick later on once I've baked this on how to get your piece looking completely perfect. So don't worry too much about it at the moment. You want it as perfect as you can possibly get it but don't stress stress about it so I like looking in from the top and if I can see black poking around the edges I like to squish that back in now the one thing that you do have to make sure that you get right this time around is make sure that you get the, the back textured so I like to just lay that down and texture up the back and then I'll take that and I'll pop that in the oven for another half an hour at 300 Celsius. Whoops, not 300 Celsius, 130 Celsius. And I'll come back when I've got all of these with a nice sandpaper back and I'll show you how to finish off the edges nicely. So, I'll see you there. Okay, so I've got this finished and baked, as you can see. Now I'm going to show you how to finish off these sides as they're a little uneven. 
Now, with this technique, I highly recommend using a soft clay. Primo is ideal for this because you want the clay to be soft but not too soft. So Sculpey 3 is going to give problems if it's a little too soft for this. But Primo is actually the ideal clay for this. So you'll just want to take a piece of clay. I usually use black because my background is almost always black. black. And you just want to warm it up in your hands. In summer you're not going to need to do this but I'm in the middle of winter at the moment and so it's a little hard. And you just want to take a little pinch of it like that. You want to stick it onto the piece of clay like that. Take your finger and smear it along like that. So that's already looking better than there. And it will smooth in all of the gaps that you might have had. And it'll just give it a much more professional look. And you'll just go around the entire edge and smear this on. You don't want to smear it on thickly. It's not supposed to look like a border. It's just so that when you look at the edge, it looks entirely black and you don't get any edges in it. You could, of course, put a border on the edges, but sometimes you don't have a design that requires a border. So this is what you do if you don't want a border. So once you've got it smeared on roughly like that, you're just going to take this part of your finger and you're going to rub it against here very lightly, smoothing it out, getting any fingerprints or gouges that you might have out of the clay and this tidies it up because you sometimes have cracks running along here and it just smooths it out you can of course use this part of your hand as well that works pretty well but I find that my hand works best for this I don't use any tools to do this Okay, once you've done that, you just want to check up on the top where your design is to make sure that none of the clay is accidentally overlapped onto your onto the face of your bead. And if it has, just smooth it off until you have something looking like this. So I'm turning it around and it looks completely black. It's much more professional. And you look at the front and it now looks much better. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for all the rest of my beads and then we can come back and I will show you how to pop resin on these because if you smooth this out perfectly with your finger you're not going to need to sand it and the thing is you don't really want to sand it because it's such a thin layer that if you sanded it you'd probably get rid of so much that you would defeat the entire purpose of putting this on. So personally if you're going to use this technique, make sure that you smooth it out so much before you put it in the oven that you don't have to sand it. And then I'll come back and show you how to put the resin on. So, I'll see you there. Okay, so I've covered all the edges of the beads, so they're nice and smooth right now. So I've done all of them. And now we are going to go ahead and pop resin on our beads. Now, I'm using a waffle mat. I do believe this is a, a waffle mat. And the reason I'm using that is so that if the resin happens to pull over the edges of the beads, which it sometimes does, it catches it in these little reservoirs and it doesn't pull around the beads. So I like to pop them on raised areas. Now, I'm going to be using ice resin to cover my beads. You can use Lisa Pavelka's resin, you can also has a resin. There's many different types of resins out there that you can use. But I'm going to be using ice resin today. So I'm just going to move this aside for a second. And now with ice resin, it is a two part resin, an equal part resin. And so you pour equal parts of the resin and equal parts of the hardener. So I'm going to just do that now because 
If I started doing it now, you wouldn't really be able to see much. So I'll just pour an equal part of the resin and I'll cut back to when I've done that. See you there. Okay, so I poured equal parts of hardener and resin into this cup and I've got five mils in here. Now I'm going to start mixing it. Now you want to try and avoid air bubbles and I do that by folding it over as though I were folding air into a cake but you are going to get air bubbles and if you were pouring this into a bezel I'd say that's a bit of a problem but because I'm pouring it onto polymer clay and so it's on a flat surface you get you get a lot of chances to get rid of that air and I'll show you that in a little while but just another thing that I want to mention is because this is a two-part resin an equal two-part resin it isn't exactly what you would call forgiving for any errors that you might have so when you are measuring out your resin you want to be as exact as possible because it, it if you get it slightly off it will stay st sticky and it won't it won't harden and then your entire project is ruined. If in doubt however add more hardener because at least if you add more hardener it will cure but it will cure faster. If you have more resin than hardener it will stay sticky. It will go hard but it will stay very sticky to the touch. See I'm just folding it in and I've got air bubbles but I haven't got too many. And I'm just going to wipe off my stick, which I'm using every now and then. And make sure that you scrape the edges of your pot. You want to have this really well mixed in. And what I say on average is I mix for about two minutes minimum. I like to mix for about three minutes probably. And um, even if I can't see any more swirls in the resin, I still carry on mixing. Because that is one of the fundamental problems when it comes to two part resins. A lot of people don't mix for long enough and so the resin and the hardener don't interact with each other properly and so you don't get a proper cure. So I can't emphasize mixing it enough. Okay, so we are almost done. Now of course a two pot resin can be very intimidating for some people and I'm not going to lie, I had a lot of problems in the beginning. A lot of my projects were messed up because I didn't do a few things properly and if you are a beginner and you're, and you're just starting and you don't want to use a two pot resin, I recommend using a one pot resin. Two pot resins of, can be very intimidating and to a beginner they can be quite hard to master. So Lisa Pavelka's resin is really good and there's a whole bunch of other resins that you can get. So we're just about done. Now I'm going to move this over here again. Now again I'm just actually going to take these off and pop them on one at a time. Now, when using resin, less is more. So, I'm going to take these and I start from one end and I work my way over because I don't want to be leaning over pieces that I've already resined. So, take my resin and I'll pour on just a little bit. I'll pour on less than I think than, that I need. Because if you pour on too much, you can't take it away. And then it pours over the edge and it's wasted. And that's another thing, if, you, if you're not used to resin, um, go with the one part because at least you know then it will cure. Because the ice resin, although cheaper than the one part, is still, it's still quite expensive to be making muck-ups. So you'll just go ahead and add a little bit like that and then you'll just spread it across. And now when you're spreading, you've got to be very careful. You don't want to be spilling it over the edges. 
because once you've broken that um, surface tension and given it somewhere to flow, it will flow. So I'm very, you have to be very careful with this and if you're just starting, expect to get a few things wrong. You can't expect to get it perfect. So I'm just going to go ahead and resin up all of these beads and I'll come back when I'm done. See you there. Okay, so I've covered these all with the resin and used up the 5 mils of resin. And I hope that you can see, but they're a lot more sparkly right now. The one bad thing about alcohol inks is when you bake them, they tend to dull on the polymer clay. But if you are putting resin on them, they, oh, they, they, the resin restores its vibrancy. And I don't know if you can see, but they all have a slightly gold tint to them. And that is thanks to the background clay that we had, which was, if you remember, gold mica clay. And so, because of the resin, the resin brings up the gold mica powders in the clay, which the alcohol inks are resting on it. Because the alcohol inks are translucent to a certain degree, you can see that. And so it just adds a really nice, sparkly dimension to the project. Now of course you don't have to use gold mica clay, you can also you can use silver and it will give it a slight silver tint, you can use pearl and it will give it a whitish tint, you can use copper and it would look well it would have a copper tint. But I just think that putting alcohol inks on top of mica clay is a really good idea to enhance the sparkliness and the depth of the piece. Now once you've covered it and let it rest for a little while, you'll see that the air bubbles that were in the resin will come to the surface and some of them will pop by themselves, but sometimes you need to coax them a little bit. And what I like to do is I like to take a straw, and I want to keep my head out the shot. And I'm not sure if you saw that, but I gave a gentle blow and it will pop the bubbles. So watch this piece over here, and I'm going to blow. I'm not sure if you saw that, but the bubbles did burst on that one. And there, it kind of clouds up the surface because your breath does contain water and the water condenses on the resin slightly and so it will fog over a little bit, but that's fine. So when you've done the resin, just go over with a straw and blow to get rid of any bubbles you have and then let it cure for 24 hours. After it's cured for 24 hours, we can come back, drill our holes and string our piece. I'll see you there. Bye. Okay, so it's been around 24 hours and this is cured. It's a little sticky still, which is normal. It, it takes 72 hours for it to be fully cured. So if you're wanting to wear it or anything, you want to wait 72 hours for that. But at about 24 hours, it's cured enough for us to drill and string the beads. Now, I use a hand drill to drill my beads. I don't like piercing them with a piercing pin when I have them raw because I find that the hole just doesn't come out as neatly as one that's drilled by hand or the power tool and I don't like using a power tool because I'm sure many of you would realize without me saying it's dangerous and unpredictable and can be very hard to use. I do use a power drill sometimes but I my preferred method is to do it with a hand drill and anybody can do it. The hand drills are really cheap and easy to get hold of and all you do is you lay your bead on your si on its side and you take your hand drill, press it where you want the hole to be and just start twisting. The beginning can be a little bit difficult but once you've got a guide hole like that it's pretty easy. Now, the one thing that I have found is that you don't want to drill from one side all the way through to the other side. You want to drill a guard hole in one side and then swap to the other side and drill another guard hole. 
and this prevents cracking and it also makes sure that your drill goes where you want it to and then you'll go back to the other side where your other guide hole is and continue to drill and you will pop your finger over where the hole is and this way you can feel when the drill is coming through now when you're drilling don't push just twist if you push you can end up accidentally breaking your clay there we are came through and also if you're putting your finger there don't push too hard because your finger is there and this is quite sharp so you'll remember after a while not to push too hard because your finger will get um, punctured <laughs> But that's basically all there is to it. I'm going to be stringing this on AccuFlex, so my hole doesn't need to be that thick. But if you were going to string it on leather, you just, with this one I have two, I can put two drill bits in at the same time. So this is my thin one, which I use for AccuFlex, and this is my thicker one, which is good for my leather that I use. Now, if you want to do a thicker cord, you'll start with a thinner drill bit and do exactly what I've done here. Then you'll swap to a bigger drill bit and you'll carry on drilling and making the hole larger. The reason you don't start with a large drill in the first place is because it can cause cracking and having a guide hole there makes it easier, safer and much tidier. So that's all there is to drilling. So I'm going to go ahead and drill these ones and I'll come back and we can string the necklace. See you there. Okay. So I've finished drilling the holes in these and I'm now going to string them. So I've got AccuFlex here. I explained the exact type of AccuFlex in the supply section. Um, I've also got copper clasp. I get my copper clasps. Well, this is an antique copper clasp. I get mine off eBay. Then I've got two Charlotte's crimps. Again, I'll also get that e off eBay. Got two copper crimps that's also available on eBay, and then I've also got some cylindrical wooden beads. And these I got off of Fire Mountain Gems and Beads, they have lots of cool beads and findings. You should go have a look, it'll be a great place to expand your bead repertoire. <laughs> okay, so what you'll do is you'll first string on your Charlotte's crimp. Then you'll take your crimp bead and you'll string that on as well. And you'll just let it slip slightly down the cord. You don't want it going too much because this is going to be covered up by a Charlotte crimp. And you're going to squeeze it. You want to do that really tight so that it's flat against the AccuFlex. Then you'll bring the Charlotte's crimp up again. And you'll close that over the crimp. And this will secure the Charlotte crimp. Now what we'll do is you'll just proceed to string. I like doing two cylinders and then a bead. Like so. Then I'll just continue doing this until I've used up all my beads. These beads. And I will come back when I've got that finished. As I'm sure you don't want to see me stringing the entire thing. So, I'll see you there. Okay, so just about finished stringing. Now we're just going to repeat what we did at the beginning of the necklace. We're going to string a Charlotte's crimp. Then we're going to string a crimp just slightly onto the AccuFlex. Pinch the crimp against the AccuFlex. Bring the Charlotte crimp up. Squeeze that tight and crimp that like so. Then I'll go over and get some jump rings. And I'll just open those up and string my clasp on to the Charlotte crimp and close up those jump rings. like so. And then I'll just repeat on the other side. And that should be our necklace. There 
here. I'll just tie that up quickly, show you. Oops. And that is basically all there is to it. Now, because this resin isn't fully cured yet, you don't want to go and put this in a bag yet. You want to leave this out in the open and let it cure for another two days or so. And then you can pop it in a bag and wear it, sell it, give it as a gift, whatever you wish to do with it. It's important to not put it in a bag at the moment because the resin will stick to the bag and you'll end up with a complete mess. So, I do hope that you enjoyed this tutorial and there will be more in the future depending on when I feel like putting it out and you know, I want to keep it as a surprise. So, if you enjoyed this tutorial, please have a look at the links below as there will be more tutorials like, that, like this one linked there and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye for now.